Hey, we've been looking at predictions of the king from the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, we've been looking at different predictions. One today is predictions of the king's advents. Notice I got an S on the end. Advent means coming. And uh, we see here and we will see that there's two comings, two comings. The first advent has already happened for us. For Isaiah, it was still yet to come. You see, Isaiah writes 700 years before Jesus Christ. And so as we look at the book of Isaiah, we need a little background. Now I'm going to tell you really something very profound, all right? You might want to get a pencil out and write this down. Chapter 9 comes after chapter 8. You say, what's so profound about that? He's building on chapter 8 when we come to chapter 9. In chapter 8, he's been talking about the Assyrians are going to come and carry away the Israelites into captivity. It is judgment, it's gloom and doom, and it's about this guy whose name is Mahershal al Hashbaz. Remember that? Yeah, if you're ever looking for a baby boy's name, there's a good one, Mahershal al Hashbaz. <clears throat> so his name means haste, haste to the spoils or to the victory. And it's about the Assyrians are going to come and capture the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, here's another little phenomenon that you're not usually aware of. It's chapter 9, verse 1 in the Hebrew Bible is the last verse of chapter 8. Wow. So this verse concludes the previous chapter. And actually, the, the, the next verse, verse 2, begins the new chapter of 9, 10, and 11, or 9 and 10 as as a, a unit in the scriptures. And so he's talking about this invasion of the Assyrians, and he says, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. You see, he's just predicted that Assyrian empire, and I got it up there in the purple, over in the Middle East, and, and you can see in the blue is the area they're going to conquer in the time of Isaiah. Okay, they're going to conquer those regions. And he says, he's told him, he's just predicted, this is going to happen. He says, but nevertheless, there will be no more gloom. That's a gloomy thought, that we're going to be captured and taken away into captivity. He says, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun. So I'm going to focus in on the map, okay? I'm zooming in on the map. This is uh, the Middle East today. You can see like the Mediterranean Sea, the Dead Sea at the bottom, the Sea of Galilee. It's the Jordan River that snakes up in between them. And he says, I'm going to humble the land of Zebulun. There's Zebulun. It lies just to the north uh, west of the Sea of Galilee. A and the land of Naphtali. Naphtali is just below the land of Zebulun. A and he says, I I I'm going to, in, in the past, he, he humbled the land. How? The Assyrians come and capture them. They are humbled. They're going to be carried away into captivity. But in the future, he will honor, the, he will honor Galilee. I'm getting a buzz back here. Are you getting that too? Yeah, if you could turn that down just a little bit. I'm way too loud. Thank you. And I thought it was just me. How many, how, how many others have hearing aids? Oh, yeah, we got a few. Every now and then you get that buzz back. So earlier I asked my wife, I said, hey, are we getting any echo here? Because I sure was getting it. And I just blame it on my hearing. Okay. Uh, but here we are. In the future, he will honor Galilee. Now, Galilee is that area there that is superimposed over both Naphtali and Zebulun. And he says then, uh, in the future, he's going to honor the Galilee of the Gentiles. Because here's what the Assyrians do. They come in and they capture the people and they carry them away into captivity and they take another people they captured and come back and transplant them in the land and so they're going to be Gentiles in the Holy Land. And he says, but in the future he will honor the Galilee of the Gentiles and the way of the sea, that section there that's just to, you, to the left of, <laughs> to the left of, the red spot and that, that, that tan color, that would be the way of the sea along the Mediterranean Sea. 
And he says, and along the Jordan. The Jordan is that little tiny river that's going between the two seas. And it goes all the way down. It's a squiggly little one. And he's saying, listen, a light is coming. You've been through gloom and doom. You've been through conquest and you've been through slaughter. You've been taken out of the land. There's now Gentiles living in your land. And then he says, but a light is coming. In fact, Jesus says this in Matthew 4, 15. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way out to the sea along the Jordan of Galilee, of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And he says this about John the Baptist. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the prediction of the forerunner. John the Baptist was going to come, and he is going to be a light, but he is a forerunner light, and I know that because what it says in verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of, the, uh, of death, a light has dawned. John chapter 1 says this. It starts out John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and that's a title for Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And then it says, and there came a man who was sent from John, uh, sent from God, there was a man who was sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. You see, here the deal is, this passage is predicting John the Baptist is going to come as a forerunner, and he's going to be predicting that the light is coming, so he's shining and reflecting the light. He's the light, but he's really not the light. He, he is the one pointing to the light, and Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. Whew. Jesus is the light. Isaiah is predicting that there's coming a time of Advent when there will be light. If you go to the, the rest of the verse, he says, verse 3, he says, you have been enlarged, uh, you have enlarged the nation and have increased their joy. They rejoice before you as a people. Rejoice at the harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the plunders. He's saying it's going to be a time of great rejoicing when the light arrives. When the light arrives. It's going to be a time of victory when the light arrives. It says, for in the days of the Midian's defeat, anybody recall that? Book of Judges, chapter 6 through about 10. There's a story of this guy by the name of Gideon. There was 100, and I believe it was 35,000 Midianites in their armies. Uh, they had uh, come against the, the nation Israel, and, and Gideon was to blow the trumpet and muster an army, and he musters an army, and God says to him, you've got too many. Was he got about 30,000 men? You got too many. And then he says, uh, you got to weed them out. Tell everybody who's afraid and doesn't want to go to battle, go home. Only 10,000 guys are left. He says, you got too many. He says, take them down to the water. And, and when, they, when they go down to get a drink, if they put their heads plunged into it, send them home. But if they lap it up and drink it, those are the guys I want you to have. So here he is. He's got 300 guys left. 300 guys left. And uh, no, there's 135,000 Midianites. Those are pretty terrible odds. And, and so what he does, he says, here's the strategy. I've got to give you a strategy for battle. I want you to have all of your men get a pitcher and a torch. You light the torch, you put it inside the pitcher so you can't see it, but there's air so it could, it'll burn. And, and I want you to take a trumpet, a, a bugle or a horn, and I want you to go out and you surround the camp. So you got 300 guys surrounding 135,000 of, uh, of the enemy, and that's at night, and when you give the signal, you crash the pitcher, clay, clay pitcher, you just smash it. The light then shines, and everybody can see it. You blow the horn, the trumpet, and, and at that moment when they did it in the night, 
All the Midianites got up and they're all totally confused. And they went out and they thought each other were the enemy and they slew and killed themselves. And 300, 300 Midianites, uh, 300 uh, uh, of the Israelites slaughter the 135,000. Listen, God's way may seem really weird. That strategy might be really strange and awkward. But God's way always works. God's way always works. To believe that Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived a perfect life, never sinned, went to the cross and died in my place, and was buried and he rose again, and if I believe he did that for me and took my, my, my place, then I am saved, my sins are gone. That seems a little bit too simple, doesn't it? Hmm. That's God's plan. God always does things in a way that should cause us to be standing and wondering, saying, wow, wow. All that's to get to the verse I really want to talk about. That was my introduction, okay? Isaiah sees two advents unfold. It's kind of like the mountain range. I used this illustration before. You see a mountain range, and as he's looking at it, he sees one peak, and then he sees another peak behind it. For him, he sees both of them, but he doesn't know there's a great distance in between. All he knows is there's two peaks there, and that's the way the, the prophets would see their prophecies. And, and as he's looking, he doesn't realize this one's the first coming and the other one's the second coming. But if he could see it from the side as he's looking, he could tell very simply that there's a first coming and a second coming, and there's a long time span in between. But Isaiah doesn't get to see it that way. And the prophets, when they saw these things, they sometimes seem to be mixing them both up because the way they see them, they just see them, it's going to happen in the future. And our text today deals with both the first advent and the second advent, the first coming and the second advent. And the, the first advent is going to focus on who the king is. Now, if you want to know who I am, I just whip out my driver's license. Now, Jesus didn't have a driver's license to identify, hey, I am the Messiah. So what he has is the credentials from the fulfilling of prophecy. These prophecies are like his driver's license to say, I am the Messiah, okay? And so in Isaiah 9, 6, it's kind of like his driver's license. It's identifying him. The first thing we realize is, the coming Messiah, the Savior of the world, is a child. Isaiah says, for, un, for to us, a child is born. Now I want to talk about that birth for a moment. It's very important. Jesus' birth was a normal, natural birth. He had a supernatural conception, but a normal delivery. He was supernaturally conceived as Adam was supernaturally created. <laughs> Jesus was supernaturally conceived. We looked at this in the last couple weeks where, where the angel came to Mary and said, you're going to have a child. And she says, wait, I think you got the wrong maid. <laughs> you sure you're not talking about the Mary that's, you know, two blocks down? You know, the one that has the double wide garage for the camels attached? You know, Mary there? Because she's married, I'm not married. I've never had sex with a man. This can't be. And he said, oh, no, no, no. You're the right Mary because the Holy Spirit is overshadowing you and the Holy Spirit's going to have power over you and is going to implant in you a divine seed. So what is going to be born to you is going to be the Son of God. You see, Jesus was conceived supernaturally, but he had a normal birth. Mary had labor pains. Thank God I'm a man. I've never had the labor pains. I've had kidney stones, and people say that's just like it, but I haven't met a woman yet that said I'd rather have kidney stones than a baby. No, listen, he had a supernatural conception, but a nat normal delivery. You know, Jesus was every much a human being as you and I are. This is so important. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, 
You get towards the end of the, the, the passage, it says in Hebrews chapter 2, I believe it's verse 14, that he had to be made like his brothers. He couldn't be made like an angel and die for us. Couldn't. We are a race, and he had to take on us, <clears throat> take on him our nature so that he could become our priest to present us to God. Not only was he our priest, but he was also our sacrifice because he offered himself as the sacrifice. Now, I want to come back to this. Is very Having a normal delivery, he lived a normal life. Jesus, it says, he grew in stature. He grew up. He was a normal human being. <clears throat> he got tired. He got hungry. He got tired thirsty. He senses everything that you sense. Wow. So he can identify with you in what you're going through completely. Hebrews chapter 4 says he was tempted in all points just as we are yet without sin. Whoa. He knows exactly the temptation you're going through, that I'm going through. He knows all of that. He's never yielded to it, and he can sympathize. You know, as soon as you yield to your temptation, boom, it's gone. Then guilt sets in, right? And another thing, the guilt sets in. Why did I do that? Why did I do that? But because he is born human, he can relate to every experience you have, except without sin, without sin. Not only will his identity be that he is the son, a child, but he is also the son. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Listen to this. He was a son before he was a child. You see, he was the second person of the eternal trinity, the Son of God, and God the Father gave the Son to become a child. He was a son before he was a child because he was and he is the Son of God. The Son of God. Now, when, when the angel visited Mary and said to her, you're going to have a child she said, it's going to be a holy one that will be implanted within you. The holy one. So you're going to have a divine nature attached to your human nature. So you're going to have a child who is going to be the God-man. He's going to be both God and man. 100% God, 100% man. And I know that doesn't make good math, but that's the way it is. He is fully God. He is fully man. He is the God-man. He is the Son of God. Now think about it. He's fully human, so he, he knows everything you're going through. He was tempted in all points, just as we are, yet without sin. Listen. He knows exactly what you're going through. And like your friends, you might tell them what you're going through. I mean, he really knows what you're going through. But unlike your friends, they can't do much about it. He is the Son of God. He can do everything about it. Just think about that for a moment. He is not just man. He is God. He goes on and said, he's the ruler, and the government will be on his shoulders. Uh, he's going to actually be the one who rules and carries the government. A and this government being upon his shoulders is the whole fact that he was born a king. He was born a king. Now, we're, we're told in, the, in the, the gospel account that Jesus was born a king, and the Magi came to him saying, where is this one born king of the Jews? And they pointed him, you know, to, to the prophecy that he would be born, according to Micah, in the little town of Bethlehem. And so they go there, and, they, and Jesus lives his whole life, and he stands before Pilate at the end of his life. And Pilate says to him, are you a king? And in an idiomatic expression of the day, he said, yeah, you said it. You got that one right. I am a king. 
And he said, if my king were of this world, my, my, my armies would fight, but my, king is from, my kingdom is from above. The day is coming when that kingdom will come to earth. We pray for that all the time. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so on Jesus, when he was crucified, there was a placard above him, King of the Jews. And he wore a crown, a crown of thorns. But when Jesus comes back in the second advent, because Jesus said he came unto his own, but his own received him not. They rejected him. But when there comes a generation that receives him, he's going to return, and he's going to set up a kingdom. He's going to have a different kind of crown. He's going to have a, a diadema crown. He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. And this king that was born in a manger is going to reign and rule on David's throne. Stay with me, because that's what the text says. Now, the stra he's a, he, he is, his identity is this. He is a strategist. And I get that out of this. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. And the New English translation of the Bible, they got a footnote and they give you all the different things. He's an amazing advisor. And then they had, uh, he is a great strategist. Strategist, I like that. He has a strategy. He's an extraordinary strate strategist. He, he, and you think about his strategy. It is so different from ours. Think about when the angels saw Jesus going, uh, leaving heaven and going to, to earth, and they said, uh, let me get this right. You're going to go down there, and you're going to be born of a virgin, and, and you're going to have two sinful parents, Joseph and Mary, take care of you. And uh, we know later they lost them, even in the shuffle going up to Jerusalem. He was lost in the crowd. They, they couldn't even keep an eye on Jesus you're going to have these parents and then I don't get it your plan is to call fishermen a tax collector a zealot a denier a betrayer to change the whole world now this is not quite the plan that you and I would have made for, but it's an extraordinary strategy can, can you imagine saying and you're going to start a new organization called the church? A new entity, a new organism, this church? And the church is supposed to change the world? It was an extraordinary plan. Because that's exactly what he did. He picked those fishermen, he picked those people. Those people told other people. Those people told down through the ages, they told us. And here we are. The church that Jesus said, I will build we're it. And every church that preaches the name of Jesus. We're it. We're here. It's an extraordinary plan. Listen to me. God has a plan for you. He does. He has a plan for you. And it is an extraordinary plan. He wants, some, he wants to do something with your life that he can't do with anyone else's life. It is his plan for you. An extraordinary plan because he's an extraordinary strategist. He goes on and he says he is the mighty God. Now when I think of the mighty God, I immediately think of the all-powerful God. Can you imagine this? The almighty, powerful God of all creation is there lying in a manger. Mind-boggling what he would do. Our God is able to do whatever he wants to do. When Mary thought it was impossible, he said, all things are possible with our God. All things are possible. He is the everlasting Father. This is his identity. He's the timeless one. He's the everlasting Father. Actually, the Hebrew words here, the nouns are in construct and not absolute. And it should probably be translated, he's Father of eternity. Father of eternity. Big difference between the way you translate that. In the Hebrew text, it's the father of eternity. And if you think of eternity, you've got to think of arrows going in both directions. In fact, you've got to go in every direction because it's, <clears throat> it's just this is eternity. It goes on and on and on. And, and he's the father of it. Now, we, we are not father of eternity. We are just a little speck, a little dot. We're just a little blip. We are within eternity because the Bible says, in him we live, move, and have our being. We're just a little dot. And once you believe in that dot, 
If you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to live forever and ever and ever and ever. You're just going to live forever and ever and ever and ever. And, and we've talked about this many times. What I believe in the dot determines where I spend the line of eternity. If I believe in Jesus as my Savior, I spend it above the line with Christ forever. If I don't accept Christ as my Savior, I spend it forever below the line without God, without Christ. The place prepared for the devil and his angels, Gehenna, or also translated lake of fire or hell. What I believe right now in time determines how I spend eternity. Now, but the text here says he's the father of eternity. You become a father when you beget a child. And what the metaphor here is, Jesus is the one who begets eternity. Well, eternity is Duration without end in any direction. If he begets that, he fosters that, he became the father the same time there is eternity. And if it always was, what he's trying to say is he is this timeless, self-existent one. Now this becomes really boggling to my mind. A God who is timeless, per eternal perpetuity, chose to unite to that a time-bound human nature and he became one of us he took our humanity for the sole purpose of going to the cross and dying for our sins because paul says that jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom i am chief wow he is the source of eternity he's the source of eternal life he is the peacemaker this is his identity he says he is the prince of peace, prince of peace. Now, the way he secures our, priest, our peace is that he was our substitute on the cross and he died in our place. You see, we were enemies of God. We were under the wrath of God, but Jesus took the wrath of God on the cross so that we might experience peace with God. And once we have peace with God, he will then give us the peace of God that peace that stills the soul and brings tranquility in a time of difficulty and storm. He is the absolute peacemaker. He then turns to the second advent, how the king reigns. How the king reigns. He says, of his increase, of his government, and the peace, there will be no end. I don't know about you, but <clears throat> since Jesus came, I don't know that the world's had much peace, has it? Peace is still coming. It's coming in the second advent. <clears throat> Remember what the, the, there he was. The shepherds were out there in their fields by night, and all of a sudden it says to the shepherds, a great host of, of angels appeared. It says, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with, with the angels, and they're praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. He was announced as the one who was going to bring ultimate peace. And it hasn't happened yet, but he's talking about second advent. When he comes a second time, he sets up a kingdom, a kingdom of peace that's going to last for a thousand years, at the end of which there's going to be the eternal state, which is going to be peace forever and ever. And this is what he also says in this passage of his government. And there's going to be this peace of, peaceful government. Our government is so corrupt, but his government is going to bring peace. You're not going to be threatened. And he will reign, he's royalty, he will reign on David's throne over his kingdom. Do you remember when Mary was visited by Gabriel the angel? She said, you will be with child and give birth to a son and, and you're to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him, there it is, the throne of his father David, just as Isaiah 900 years had, had predicted. 900 years before. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. He goes on and he says, In the increase of his government will peace and there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forever, uh, on forever. We have a political system that is so corrupt. 
People try to tell me that we're in the kingdom now. I don't think so. Jesus will return and he will set up a kingdom. He will establish it and it's going to be upheld with justice and righteousness. And when it's upheld with justice and righteousness from that time and forevermore, you are going to feel very safe and secure. You're going to be safe and secure in Jesus. He says, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I want you to imagine for a moment. Jesus, when he entered into the temple and he saw they made the temple a a place of merchandise, he made a whip and he overthrew the tables and he drove out the animals and he overturned the money changer stables and said, the zeal of the Lord uh, for the temple, the zeal of the temple has eaten me up. He got angry and he drove out the enemy that made the place, the house of God, a place of a business and not a place of prayer. And likewise, that same kind of ardent zeal, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. When he returns, he's not wearing a crown of thorns. He did that once at the end of the age. He put himself to, had himself allowed to be put to death for our sins. He's coming back the second time to set up his kingdom that will just be an introduction to the eternal state. All right, so what do we get out of all of this? What do we take away? In Jesus' first advent, his first coming, the incarnate Son of God, the God-man came. He is the king who will rule supremely. He is the greatest strategist who ever lived. He is the all-powerful God of creation who controls time from eternity and is the ultimate peacemaker. That's all we're told in this verse about the first advent of Christ. Wow. In the second advent, Jesus will bring eternal peace and prosperity. By setting up and securing a kingdom of justice and righteousness and have a passionate love for all of us because he's doing it all for you and me. Now that's a lot to take away. That's a lot to take away. I want to sum it up. Sum it up just the way John did. In the Revelation, John said this, Even so, come Lord Jesus. Even so. Oh, come is the word Advent. Even so, Advent Lord Jesus. First Advent, second Advent. Say it with me. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Say it again. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for Isaiah's prophecy 700 years before Christ. And yet, Lord, right down to the details, uh, the first advent, they're fulfilled. The second advent will fulfill the second half of those details because the same Jesus who came the first time is coming the second time. Lord, I pray that everyone here has received Jesus Christ in their hearts has lifted up that prayer and said, Lord, you know I'm a sinner and I can't save myself, but Jesus took my place. I accept him now as my Savior and I'll make him my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Lord, I know anyone who asks Jesus to be saved, he will save them and change them from the inside out. And Lord, we look towards this Christmas season reflecting on the first advent. But we also look to the second advent and we pray, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.